Hi, I'm Gwen Griffin with Old World Foundation, and I'm here today with Jeannie Christensen. Um, Jeannie is the Historic Gardens Coordinator at Old World Wisconsin. And Old World Foundation supports the animals, the gardens, historic preservation projects, education and public programs at Old World Wisconsin. And today we're gonna to talk about the gardens with Jeannie. So welcome, thanks for joining me today. You're welcome. So how many heirloom gardens are there at Old World Wisconsin? Basically, there's 13 heirloom gardens. However, when you think of a garden, they're all different sizes. So you could say at Raspberry School, we have an heirloom garden, but it's very small. When you go over to the 1880 Yankee Farm, it's a huge garden. So I would say we have 13 heirloom gardens. However, they vary in many different sizes. Okay. And when we hear the word heirloom, um, you know, I guess I think old, but what does heirloom really mean? The definition seems to be a debate. It depends on who you're talking to, what heirloom actually means. But if you really get down to it, it's just an item that's been passed down from generation to generation. And especially like when it's a, a plant, um, it could be considered a seed or a part of a plant that someone has dug up um, a division from year to year or decade to decade. So I like to think of it as a plant that's been passed along for, for many generations. I know um, reading some sources, they say at least 50 years old. Well, that in a lot of people's mind, 50 years isn't that old. Uh, so they like to think of it as at least a century old or more. So I think it's just up to the person what they want to really describe it or define it as. Gotcha. And what um... What kind of vegetables do you grow on site? We grow a variety. And what I've tried to do um, in my two years here was to go through the, the past designs and layouts of the gardens to get a better idea of what was growing in the gardens, as well as my volunteer crew who help out in the gardens. They were a wealth of information and in assisting me decide what should and should not be planted in certain gardens. So for the varieties and such, uh, it changes just a tiny bit each year. Uh, we've instigated uh, a new program of trying to collect our seeds. I know they have collected seeds in the past, but now we're trying to make an effort that we're not getting any uh, cross-pollination between varieties so we can make sure that the variety is going to be true. Uh, so with that being said, some of the gardens now don't have two or three different types of cabbage, for example, or uh, something like that, just, just so we don't run the risk of having any cross-pollination happening. So for example, like in Life on the Farms, um, all three farms there, the one at the 1870s Hessian Farm, 1880s Pomeranian and 1860s Pomeranian, they all have potatoes and they're all russet potatoes. Uh, but we have to remember that that's just a representation that we're showing people and our guests because the immigrants really would have had those in much more larger quantities, probably planted out in a field adjacent to the garden or the home instead of actually being in the garden itself. Mm. So we do, in um, the German area or like in the farms area, we like to grow um, early Jersey Wakefield cabbage, Savoy, cabbages that the, those early immigrants would have used um, during the 1860s and 1880s. Um, onions are there. Uh, I would say right now, the number one question I'm getting when I'm working out in the gardens there is what is this plant? And it's the walking onion. And it's so unique because it looks like an onion. However, it's got the little bulbs on the top of the plant where it normally would have the flower. And people are like, wait, shouldn't that be underground? Well, that's why it's called, it's called a walking onion. What happens is those bulbs at the top of the plant get a bit too heavy. So it pulls down the plant or the stem. And then that the bulb will root into the soil, giving it like a walk, like a walking onion. It just continues to do that. So that's a real good conversation piece um, in our German area. Uh, people really like that, that walking onion plant. Um, they, they also like, besides vegetables, they're the, the herbs. Um, it's hard to classify herbs as vegetables or flowers because they're in, really in a class of their own. But I'd like to just point out that we've got a lot of herbs there and the facilitators like to use the herbs in a lot of their programming, their cooking as well as just the hands-on cutting and tying them up in bunches to hang from different um, racks in the home. So uh, we grow all, a lot of the herbs too. Uh, 
at those farms. Uh, we, of course, grow beets and cabbage. Uh, like I said, the cabbage this year, though, um, I hate to say it has been chewed upon by a lot of critters, not only wildlife, but our sheep have gotten into uh, the garden several times. So they've been replanted and replanted and now we're pretty much out of cabbage transplants. So what you see is what we've, we've got for the year. Um, we also have um, kale. Kale is a very, um, it seems like to be more popular with guests. They know it now because they're eating more of it. And we've got a lot of kale growing in that area also. Uh, another plant, um, the scarlet runner bean, which is growing up a trellis over at our 1860s Pomeranian garden. That's another plant that a lot of people are interested in. They question it. They, they're like interested in growing it in their own garden uh, because not only is it nice as an ornamental, but it's got edible value to it also. And then we, if we travel over to a different area um, in the, let's say the, the village, the Crossroads Village, We've got the 1880s Yankee Farm, where there's some really unique different types of vegetables uh, that we grow there. Um, for example, we've got, the, we have corn growing there, uh, the, the Sowell's Evergreen Corn, the Sweet Corn. Unfortunately, that garden also has been hit by critters. I was just out there this morning. And there are deer tracks everywhere. Uh, they've dug up the corn, they've dug up the squash, um, they they helped mow down some of the pumpkins as they walked through. They just stomped all over the pumpkin ceilings. So it's, it's been a little bit of a challenge in, in that garden this year. Um, but one, one plant I like to point out at the Sanford 1880s Yankee Farm is the Queen Anne's melon. And that is just a small little pocket melon. It only gets uh, probably maybe five inches, maybe four inches diameter or so. Easy enough to put it in your pocket and it was used by women as a deodorizer because it had such a nice sweet fruity smell. And it, of course, in, in those days, they really didn't have deodorants or things like that. So they would use natural things. And the Queen Anne's melon is one that uh, brings a lot of uh, conversation to a lot of our experiences. Uh, and then if we travel up to Scandinavian, we've got uh, the Pedersen Garden, which uh, is the 1890s Dane Garden, where we've got a lot of medicinal herbs as well as some vegetables, like we have the potatoes there. And we've got uh, cucumbers, which are, again, are slow in coming. We've had a very dry year, as we all know, and a lot of the seeds just didn't germinate properly to begin with. Um, after reseeding, now they're coming back and we, they're, they're starting to come. We should have a crop. Uh, we also have uh, cucumbers, uh, like I said, as well as carrots um, and beets and turnips. Again, this year, though, the beets, uh, we, We've got several different varieties. The Solyndra uh, is one that we, we planted quite a bit of, and it's just not coming up. It comes up, and then something's chewing that off. So what I'm thinking is, I'm, I'm not certain on this, but my thought is because we were lacking so much water, we weren't getting enough rainfall, a lot of the animals were looking for water, and they were finding it in these young seedlings that were popping up from the ground. So that's why we've got that issue this year. Yeah, that makes sense. Got to get moisture somehow, right? Right. <clears throat> huh. Well, you have, you know, a lot of vegetables and I, boy, that's really interesting. The, the pocket melons and the walking onions. Those are, <laughs> I'm going to remember those. It's uh, interesting. Um, you also have a lot of flowers on site. Are there, um, you know, particular flowers that you plant for particular reasons? Tell us about, about the flowers. Sure, there are actually two gardens that um, the flowers really are one of the main parts of the garden. And one of them, of course, is uh, the Kobali Garden or the 1860s Norwegian, where we have facilitators that do dyeing of wool at that site. Mm -hmm. And um, Ellen, who is our anchor in that area, she is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to growing plants for dyeing and has directed me to grow certain plants there. Um, Jennifer is another one of our facilitators who assisted last year with uh, uh, one of our programs that you had to register for in the fall. And she did one with the wool and with the sheep, sheep to shawl, I believe it what it was called. And she had some input too on what plants should be grown. So we consider that garden at the 1860s Norwegian our dye garden. 
and D-Y-E, because when we mention that to some guests, they're like, dye and garden, it doesn't sound good. Uh, <laughs> but we really do mean that we're just changing the color of, of wool and such. And some of the, the plants that they have asked us to be growing in there are certain types of hollyhock with very dark petals, like hollyhock nigra, because that way they can actually get that nice deep color and it will uh, really dye quite well. They have marguerite daisies. They have certain types of marigolds and zinnias. Uh, they have uh, elderberries, the elderberry shrubs that they use, they use those. And this year we added aronia, which is a chokeberry, and that is a native, and that would have probably grown um, in this area. And um, a lot of the immigrants would find a plant that was useful or a value, and they would transplant it into their own garden or their property. So with that thought in mind, that is why we brought in some aronia, and they can use those berries, which are just beginning to turn right now in our gardens here. Um, they should be able to use those for dye. So there's all different ones that are in there. A lot of guests have questions like, wow, I didn't even know that this plant would do that. And uh, so it's a really good focal point, not only in the garden, but also because of the dying that's going on there. Hmm. And then the other garden that I'd like to point out with the flowers is the 1880s Yankee Farm in the village, Sanford House, because a lot of the plants or flowers that were growing there not only benefit the, the immigrants because of the cut flower value and the fresh flower that they could cut and bring into bouquets, but many of them were grown for drying. Some of them uh, would easily just grow when you are, excuse me, dry if you would cut them and tie them together and hang them upside down. Some of them like amobium as well as straw flowers, they pretty much have dry petals to begin with, and so those were used quite a bit. But we have other plants, of course, like lavender that they would have dried and uh, celosia, uh, coxcomb, we've got that. So a lot of those flowers that we have growing there are dual purpose because it's not only looking nice in the garden, it's also looking nice in the house. Would they make kind of like a potpourri out of them for, for the fragrance? Yes, they would also do that too. Um, and that I, I found some information in some of the paperwork and files that I've been looking through that it was not only at that house, but other houses in the village, they would actually use different types of potpourri that they made from garden, the plants in the gardens without the, in the houses at the Crossroads Village. Okay, nice. Um, and it sounds like, or I, I actually saw the other day when I was there, um, you have created a new, is it a universal garden next to the shoe shop? Yes, uh, and the reason we decided to do that, uh, pre-pandemic, we had a group come in, an agency from Walworth County, to train our staff on how to deal with guests with dementia, so making our, our site more dementia friendly. And after I went through the training, I thought about it a bit, that coupled with knowing that we have some accessibility issues here at Old World and we want to overcome those, I thought, why don't we try to create a garden using one of our own existing gardens uh, to maybe fit that, that niche that we're trying to fill to bring more accessibility uh, and have a garden that's there for everybody. So that's why I came up with the universal design. Um, as a horticulturist, that's the type of design that is done for all ages and all abilities. No matter what a person's ability is, they should be able to um, enjoy the experience working in that type of a garden. So that's why I decided to use the, the Sissel Garden because there was a beautiful garden, existing garden there already, an island bed planting that um, the volunteers told me that, you know, they put it, situated it there because then the person would be able to look out the, the upstairs window to enjoy the garden. So um, using that garden, I just kept it the same, that garden the same, I did a design around it. Using a path that um, in a universal book, um, design garden, you wanna make sure the path is inviting as well as not restrictive. And you wanna make sure it's wide enough for people to get through uh, and with a substance that if, if someone has a walker or a wheelchair, or has difficulty walking, they should be able to walk on it. It's not a, like a lumpy grass path or anything like that. So um, our maintenance staff put that in. And uh, 
I just used the existing garden along the fence, but added the interior garden underneath the cherry tree. And the goal was to use as many heirloom plants that had some type of sensory aspect to them to and include those in the garden. So that's why uh, many of the plants, basically all of them uh, have some type of uh, aspect or trait characteristic that will stimulate one of your senses. Now I stayed away from the, the sense of taste, of course, because I don't want to have to worry about allergies or anything like that, and especially with the pandemic. So uh, most of them are just the other four senses. So for example, I left the, the cherry tree because cherry tree has that nice scaly paper chip like bark that people can go and touch. Um, we've got a lot of uh, like mint, um, and you know with the mint family, there's a lot of different plants in the mint family like Monarda, um, which grows native and that would have been like a plant that could have been brought in. Um, but it also inspires people to think of, oh, I, I remember that plant growing in so-and-so's garden or, or something like that, or that grew in the fields where my grandmother grew up. Uh, we've got peonies, of course, and peonies seems to be the number one plant that people say, oh, that's what I remember from great grandma's garden. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to bring in those evoke memories, um, speaking with people that um, I know of that have some memory issues bringing them into some uh, an area where there's objects from the past really will stimulate their memory and bring out conversations. So that's what we're trying to do, encourage that, as well as encourage other people with limited abilities to be able to stop, touch a plant, feel it, um, have that tactile experience, they can smell it, uh, maybe that would stimulate something. Uh, I know I have a garden volunteer who loves lemon balm because after she's done working in the gardens all day, she said the best thing she can do is grab a few lemon balm leaves, go home and make a tea out of it for a calming effect. Mm -hmm. uh, so plants can really be useful in that manner. And that's why I just thought, why don't we try to incorporate this at Whole World as well as, as our population is changing and we're learning more and more about how nature really assists with mental health and our well-being why not just bring that back to old world because that's pretty much what it's always been with all our nature trails and things like that here um actually we've got it all if you really think about it we just don't have heirloom gardens we've got the environment that will just be great for everyone's mental health and well-being i think yeah well and and we were talking earlier about the this time of year, all the wildflowers are blooming and it's, it's really beautiful. It's a great time of year to be, be visiting Old World. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we didn't talk about? Well, I of course wanted to do a shout out to my volunteers because last year I didn't have volunteers assisting with the gardens. So that was a lot of work, um, but I found it very therapeutic myself doing a lot of the gardening. However, I, I really did miss them, so I'm so glad that they were able to come back. Uh, I don't think they realize how much they're needed here. Sometimes they're, they're like, okay, we just did all that, but it doesn't look like we did enough, but every little bit helps. And with their knowledge, their skills, there's so many different skills they bring to, to the old world. Uh, I don't know how I would have been able to, for example, yesterday I had a garden volunteer come in and make some trellises for me. And, you know, Volunteer Bob can do a lot of different things, but when I said, hey, can you help me do this too? He gladly does it. And that he's just a picture of, of what all the volunteers are. They're very willing and giving and their time and talents are, you know, you can't put a price on it really. Right, right. Very true. And we also have to mention that we do get a lot of uh, assistance from um, other organizations like the Herb Society um, and garden clubs. Not only do they help us monetarily, but we also get donations from some of them for some of our programs and activities. Mm -hmm. So we can't always do it all here. We do know that we've got some other organizations that are very willing to assist us in whatever we need. Right. Yeah, we're very, very appreciative for, for donor support. Um, that's what um, as you said, that's what's needed to go above and beyond to, to get things done um, at Old World, whether it's the gardens or the animals or preservation, you know, all of that. Um, and, and we're very thankful. 
Um, and Old World Wisconsin is open now on Wednesdays for guided tours by reservation only, and then Thursdays through Sundays from 10 until 4. Um, and people can visit the Old World Wisconsin website at oldworldwisconsin.org for um, all the information on what's going on. And uh, to make a donation or to hear or to, to read about how Old World Foundation supports Old World Wisconsin, you can uh, visit the Old World Foundation website and that's oldworldfoundation.org. So um, thank you again for your time today, Jeannie. You are welcome, it was great to be here. Yeah, I learned a lot. So we will say until next time, um, thank you and goodbye.